Let me just keep a running list over here. Things to know. First thing to know. Kelvin is equal to Celsius. What was that equation we had in chapter one? That's 273. And 273 is good enough. I think in your book they've got 273.15. We don't need that many sig figs. So make it a little bit easier on yourself. So every time we work gas laws, think Kelvin, or the gas laws aren't true. Okay, now let's come here. Another one. <clears throat> we got to talk about amount of gas. So we talk about moles of gas. And they abbreviate that with a small letter F, which then seems really stupid at first until you think. We use capital M already for something. And what was that? Molarity. Molarity. And if you take 1412, they use lowercase m to stand for another concentration unit, molality. So they used up the Fs. And so they chose N for number of moles. Now let's review something, chapter 2. We have to do this forever and ever as long as we take chemistry. If you have grams and you need to get two moles, you know we use the formula weight. What do we do? Divide. Divide. Good. And if you're coming back, what do we do? Multiply. Multiply. Now, when we first had this, we used formula weight. As we get, excuse me, as we get in this chapter, they're going to say molecular weight. Here's the, the real thing. Formula weight can be used on any substance. Technically, molecular weight should only be said for covalent substances. But people are sloppy in their language, and they tend to use it either place. But formula weight encompasses both ionic and covalent, but molecular weight should be only for the covalent substances. So if we need to go back and forth, we know moles is equal to grams over, and I'm going to start using here, molecular weight. Because gases are normally covalent. Then one more, and I think this is the hardest one for people, and it is pressure. Okay, pressure. You know what it means in a psychological sense. You got a test next Thursday in a week, and that probably you feel some pressure. Oh my God, I've got to study so much, and my finals are coming up the next week, and you know what that feels like. Okay, but here in a science, if we hike down the hall to the physics department, and we ask down the hall in physics, what is pressure, the way they define it, is force per unit area. Now, how does that apply to gases? Let's take this container. We've got a gas sample in this sealed up container. And we talk about inside it has a certain pressure. What's making that pressure or contributing to the pressure? Okay. What are the gas molecules doing? Constant motion. So if on the inside of the container I marked off one square centimeter, what is that square centimeter experiencing? Those gas molecules popping into it. So it's the motion of the gas molecules that's creating that force per unit area. Now oddly enough, the units that we use in a chemistry class at first do not make any sense at all. We measure pressure in millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury. Well, hey, milliliters, that's a distance. How could that possibly be force per unit area? Well, the first barometers. <coughs> We don't do this anymore, we're a little more sophisticated, but back in about the 1600s, Torricelli came up with the first barometer. He filled some sort of a container with mercury, open to the air. I think you see why we don't do this anymore, because now we know how toxic mercury is. Even when I was in college, 
people didn't realize how toxic mercury was. We used to play with it and roll it around in our hands, throw it at the wall and watch it splatter. People just didn't realize. I even saw a picture in National Geographic, this huge tank of mercury, this guy floating on it, just to show how high you would float on something as dense as mercury. I wonder if he's still alive or not. But Torricelli took a bowl of mercury and then took a glass tube, and it had to be fairly long. In fact, it had to be over 760 millimeters. So from finger to finger is 760. So he probably took a glass tube at least a meter long. Okay, it's sealed at one end, it's open at the other. He filled it with mercury very carefully inverted it so it wasn't slammed down to the bottom of the bowl. And if you did that, I would have two thoughts. I would think, one, all the mercury would run out, or two, all the mercury would stay there. And the real result was neither. That what happened is some of the mercury would flow out into the bowl, but not all of it. And if it's an ordinary day at sea level, and remember mercury has a convex meniscus, not like water. If you measured from the top of the meniscus to the surface on an ordinary day, at 760 millimeters. And what Torricelli noticed is it varied from day to day, or if a big storm blew in it would be different. So how did he explain what was going on here? This is the explanation. What is the surface of this mercury experiencing? The molecules in the air bombarding it, force per unit area, hitting that, with enough force to support a column of mercury 760 millimeters high. Now, he was smart to use something so dense. First, you have to use a liquid, obviously, to get into, to pour into a tube. He was smart to use mercury because if he had used water, because density of water is 1 and the density of mercury is almost 14, he would have had to have a tube 14 times longer than this. Now, can you, can you think about having a glass tube 14 times longer than this, you're going to fill it with water, and then you're going to invert it. First, you wouldn't be doing it in a classroom. You'd be out in a hallway, maybe, well, in the stairway or outside, and the chance of breaking that would be huge. And so it wouldn't be feasible to do it with water. Possible, but not feasible. So they did that. And to honor Torricelli, they called that the Tor. Probably thinking we would be too stupid to spell Torricelli. And so they called it the Tor. So millimeters of mercury and Tor are the same. Which means if I invent something or come up with something, they'll call it the cart. Because they would have used the whole thing. So, 760 Tor. So down here, millimeters of mercury or Tor, that's one and the same. And I was just reading this fascinating book a week or so ago called Galileo's Daughter. And it's based on that when Galileo died, Torricelli was in the room. They were contemporaries of each other and talked about science projects because there weren't that many scientists back at that time. And so I hadn't realized they were not only contemporaries, but they were friends that talked over ideas. So, millimeters of mercury. That's the story on Torricelli and why we got that abbreviation. Now, if you're at sea level, that's also referred to as one atmosphere. And that's nice for us because we live just about sea level. So, on an ordinary day in Houston when there's no storms around us, pressure here is 760 millimeters, or 760 tor, also said to be one atmosphere. On your weather report, how did they give pressure? Inches of mercury. So it comes from the same idea, but because we're in this country, 
instead of using millimeters, they use inches. And I think that's about, in fact, let's, let's check, I think. Okay, we got 760, roll it over. That's about 30 inches of mercury. So that's why you hear weather reports in inches of mercury when if you've had a physics class, that should seem really weird when you think pressure is force per unit area. What are you doing measuring it in inches? Okay, so those are our variables that we need to be comfortable with. And now let's get into the first laws. Here's what we're going to do. Here's a preview. We're going to study laws individually. We're going to talk about Boyle's Law. We're going to talk about Charles' Law. We're going to talk about Avogadro's Law. And then we're going to throw it all together and say, here is the combined gas law. Okay, so let's go through it individually. And while we're keeping, we're keeping a list here, it would also be good to put 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to 760 torr, which is equal to one atmosphere. And we can put dots there if we want to maintain three sig figs. Yeah. Why doesn't um why are we doing dot dot law? Does that not apply? Okay. Um, for the gas law stuff, um, usually who we consider is Boyle and Charles and Avogadro. What do you know about Dalton's law? Well, we just talked about an A and B because of uh -huh. gas exchange and like the uh -huh. lines and everything. And Dalton's law is like one of the things that we call it. Like it's Okay. okay, toward the end of this chapter, we have what's called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. But it's for us, it's a minor law. Maybe for living, it's a major law. But for us in this class, it's a minor law. I'm okay. seeing how yeah. related. Yeah, well, it's coming down in one of the later sections here. But we will talk about it if we have time today or on Tuesday. Okay, Boyle. Boyle was English, and he lived in the 1600s, the same time uh, Galileo was alive and Torricelli was alive. And they realized even back then, if you're going to study something, you can only change one variable at a time. And so we've looked at, when you talk about gases, there are four variables. So when Boyle was doing his work, what he did is say, okay, I'm going to keep N constant. How much gas I'm working with is going to be constant and temperature constant. So just work in a room where the temperature is not changing or work with an insulated container. And this is not the kind of apparatus he used, but this makes the idea simpler. Let's have a sealed up system with a piston on the top. So everything is sealed up. We've got a gas sample in there. We know those particles spread out to take whatever volume. So it's sealed so that N is constant. No gas can get out. No gas can get in. And we keep it at the same temperature. Okay, if we increased pressure, if pressure goes up, now how could you increase pressure? Well, you could simply push down with your hand, or you could put, if you've looked at OWL, they put little weights on here to increase pressure. What would happen to volume? If pressure goes up, what's going to happen to volume? It's going to go down. There is an inverse relationship. You guys are so clever here in the 21st century. Because that probably took months and months of Boyle's life, doing experiments over and over and over. And then what he stated was that there's this inverse relationship and a statement of his law at first. You don't need to write this down. Wait till we get to the bottom line. Pressure is inversely, and this is a proportionality constant, is inversely proportional to pressure. Okay, we as chemists hate proportionality. Maybe your math teachers like them and uh, torture you with them, but we don't like them. And so what we do is turn them into equations. So I want to turn this into an equation. If I do this many, many times, 
I can put in a proportionality constant and turn it into an equation. Now, K stands for constant. So your first thought is probably chemists are fools because they can't spell constant. But this is the German spelling for con the word constant is why it's different. And so I want to take that. What I want to do is I want to put the variables all on one side and have the constant over hanging out by itself. So I'm going to multiply both sides by P. So I will have V, P is equal to K. Okay, now that's a statement of Boyle's Law that as long as you do not change temperature or how much gas you have, the product of these two things should be constant. Okay, so you go in first thing in the morning. You got your gas sample. You measure the pressure, you measure the volume, that's equal to K. You come back two hours later, you either increase the pressure or decrease the pressure by pulling up on it. That is also equal to K. Well, if they're both equal to this same constant, if they're K is equal to K, then this is equal to that. So a statement of Boyle's Law is that. V1, P1 must be equal to V2, P2. That's the important stuff. But what we got, we derived it from Boyle's first ideas. Now let's take a look at a problem here, 12-1 in your chapter. So this is when you need your calculators. So if you don't have one, go get one. The wording in the textbook is almost identical to this. I think they may put in it's 1.2 atmospheres and they may give you some other you know, millibars or something. We're not going to use bars and millibars in our discussion. But when we talk pressure in this class, we are going to talk either atmospheres or torques or millimeters of mercury. So let's analyze this when we read it. We have a sample of gas. Now notice, they don't tell you what you got because it doesn't matter. This statement right here of Boyle's Law, you can have nitrogen or oxygen or any gas and it will obey this law if the gas is acting ideally. And there's, later on we'll see the so-called ideal gas law. And what that means is the gas is obeying all the laws, and not all gases do, but for us, they're going to obey the laws. So, first part, we have this sample of gas, it has 12, 12 liter volume, and it's under a pressure of 1.2 atmospheres, that's our first sentence. Okay, take a look at that number right there. You know how many six? It's two, two, and how many six? Two, two. Then the question is, what is its volume if the pressure is increased to 2.4 atmospheres? Let's think two things first. When you finish up, how many sigs do you want in your final answer? Two. two. Okay, we can never forget sig figs. The other thing is, we must be very careful when we use this. P1 and P2. We can use tor, we can use atmospheres, but you've got to be consistent. For volume, you can use liters, or you can use milliliters, but you've got to be consistent. So when you have a problem like this, and see that last sentence says, assume n, the number of moles in T are constant. So if they don't tell you that, assume they're constant. And sometimes, just to mess with your mind, it will say, and the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. And then they'll say down at the second sentence, the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Constant, don't sweat it. So we have a classic Boyle's Law problem. So V1, P1 is equal to V2, P2. There are four variables, and you can be asked for any one of them. And so somewhere in the problem, they've got to give you three of them, and then you sort for the fourth one. 
Okay, do we have V1, Russell? Yeah. What is it? 12 liters. 12 liters. Okay, do we have P1, Pedro? Yes, 1.2. 1.2 atmospheres. We are asked to find V2, and then our P2 is what, Tran? 2.4. Okay, we do a double check, and I've been lazy here. This was liters, so we know this is going to be liters.